So hello again. Today we're going to be talking about counters. In order to do so, we have to first think about what a counter is and differentiate between synchronous and asynchronous counters. In some previous examples, we did some problems where we would make counters with traditional k-maps and truth tables, and that works fine. This video is mostly going to focus on asynchronous counters, where the flip-flops will not change at the same time. They will have different clocks. This will be easier to understand later on, but basically what will happen is that the output of one flip-flop will become the clock of the next, and this way you can create a time diagram that follows a proper counter. So let's get started. Here I have the table for a counter that takes into account the clock pulse. So each of these numbers is the pulse that it is on. For this example, we'll be drawing time diagrams. Time diagrams show us the pulse of the clock and what the output for each flip-flop is. So let's start with that. So in these diagrams, a low line will represent a zero, and then it turns into a one for a high, and so on. So this is going to be our clock. Ideally, it will have equal intervals of equal DC values, and it will help us determine what goes on with the other flip-flops. So what we want for Q0 is that in pulse 1, here we name this pulse as 1, this pulse as 2, and this pulse as 3. We're only going to do the first three pulses because I feel like that is enough to get the idea. So at pulse 0, it has an undefined value. Basically, we don't care what it was in the flip-flop beforehand. It'll change to 0 now. So at pulse 1, the value of Q0 is going to be 0. But then at pulse 2, it changes to 1. And back again to 0. It's important to notice how, in this case, I am doing the changes in the ascending clock. Sometimes you will be told to do something different, or it could be both. It could be either descending, ascending, or both. I actually might need some more pulses for this, so I'm just going to keep on drawing. For Q1, we notice that it changes every two. So this is basically what we're doing. If you watched one of my previous videos, I mentioned that to count in binary, it's easy to name the bits and then just change the least significant bit every single line. And then for the next significant bit, you're going to um, do two to the first power in this case to see that you change the value every two lines and then for the most significant bit in this case, I'm going to change it to 2 squared, which is 4. So every 4 lines, you will change the value. So this will really help us to visualize these counters, because that's basically what we're doing. We're saying that for each pulse, the value of Q0 will change. That's the same as saying for each line, the value of Q0 will change. So if we do Q1, we'll see that it'll change every 2 pulses. Let me lower these because it kind of got bigger than what I thought it would be. So for Q1, we see that it changes every two pulses. So we see that in line 3, in pulse 3, let me just show it to you. Right there, our Q1 will change to 1. So it'll change right here. Then it changes again. Let me just number these other pulses. It'll change back at pulse 5. So it changes right here. Remember, we're considering the ascending clock so we only we can only change when the clock changes from 0 to 1. And then our last and most significant bit is Q2. We do the same process and we see that it changes for the first time in 5 and it goes on as 1 through 6. So this will help us visualize what is going on. Here we see that the value is going to be 0. Let me do this in red. The value for these bits will be 0 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And here it'll be 0, here it'll be 1, here it'll be 0 again, here it'll be 0, here it'll be 1. So if we were to read what is happening each time interval, because this is on, say, a time graph, where this is just what is going on each time, so let's say this is like so this is a graph plotted on time, so let's say that each pulse is one second. If we count 
here is t0, then this will be t equals one second, t equals two seconds, and so on. So if we were to read this from t0 to t1, what we get if we go down across all the line is that our value between this time interval will be 0, 0, 0, which is what we wanted. Then we look at the second one, we see that it'll be 0, 0, 1. And then let's just do one more so that we know for sure how to do this. If you go across the line, we have a value of q0, which is 0, a value of q1, which is 1, a value of q2, 0. So this would be 0, 1, 0. So for the next part of our problem, I've drawn three flip-flops, and I've specified that they are d flip-flops just for simplicity. So remember that the truth table for d flip-flops is that it'll store whatever value it receives. So very simple. From the timetable, we see that there seems to be a pattern. First of all, we see that whenever the previous bit, so the least significant bit changes, the more significant bit will change to its opposite value. So how can we think about that in terms of flip-flops? We can say that inverse output of the flip-flop can be reinserted as the input for the next value. And then Something else that we can say is that it only changes after the pulse of the previous bit. So for example, you see here that this, let me just erase this so it's clear. For example, this is one pulse for Q1. So after Q1 completes a pulse, Q2 will change to its inverse value, right? So this means that Q1 is acting as a new clock for Q2. So this is how asynchronous counters work. They will use each other as clocks instead of using separate clocks as a synchronous counter would. So let's try to draw this with the flip-flops. This little triangle means clock. So whatever goes in there will be the clock input. We have our input D. And here we have the output Q. Q note. So now that we have all of the inputs and outputs labeled, we can start actually creating the circuit that we've kind of visualized with the time graph. So first thing we said is that Q will be the inverse of the output. So if we grab Q naught and return it to the input, we will have that inverse effect. And now we have to deal with the clocks. So we see that the first flip-flop for Q0 will in fact have the clock that is used at the beginning. So this will just be hooked up to a regular clock. And now for the other ones, as we've discussed before, they will change after the period or pulse of the previous bit. So we're going to use the output Q from the previous bit as the clock for the new flip-flops, as you can see here. And that is mostly it. Usually you will hook LEDs or some kind of output device to the cues to show the actual counting. And if you hooked these up to LEDs, then you would be able to see how it stores the value and counts from, in this case, 0 to 7. So that's the basics on asynchronous counters. I hope this was helpful.